were part of that movement. Popular elected government that wasn't necessarily hostile to American business interests, but saying, let's have something more equitable. Like, why don't we control our own resources? Very similar to, uh, and I guess when I mentioned the Shah, the Shah was put in place after a popularly elected Iranian Prime Minister, Mossadegh, basically attempted to nationalize Iranian oil, saying, look, why should British Petroleum get 80% of the profit from our oil? Why don't we get 60% and y'all get 40%? What year was that? Sandino was assassinated. Sandino was assassinated, I believe, in the 30s. Yeah. Okay, so, in case this shows up on a final near you, what's the difference between a strong man and a dictator? We, that is the United States, like the strong man, and he likes us. Otherwise, functionally, there isn't a difference. Saddam Hussein was a strong man who supported and was supported by the United States government. The Shah of Iran was a dictator that the United States propped up. Manuel Noriega, a strong man. So, dictator and a strong man. The U.S. doesn't like the, don't like the dictator because he won't play with the U.S., in particular our companies. So the same person or people in the same role can be either a dictator or a strongman. So a strongman is simply a press-friendly name for a person who may be violently suppressing their people. Is that Somoza? Somoza, right. Right? So, Nicaragua is one of the classic Banana Republic stories of union, U.S. colonialism, right? So, when strongman, dictator, i.e., strongman, Somoza kills a newspaper reporter, that provides a spark that provokes a left-wing revolution in Nicaragua. Okay? A left-wing revolution provokes, in a right-wing American government, a response. Start training an army among sympathizers of the former strongman. You may wonder what this has to do with cocaine in America. Well, we're getting to that. Setting the context. <coughs> this takes money to train that army, and Congress won't give you any, especially after an election in 1984 confirms the revolution as democratically elected. Well, yeah, we're the leader of the free world and we're about democracy, so when the democracy elects somebody that uh, is for their own people and not for American business, or not for the American business at the expense of their own people, well, we have a problem with that. And this, when the CIA gets that money for the cocaine, then they uh, don't have to report to Congress to Tell them what they're spending it on. Yes, but the CIA, yeah, before we get to that, right? So, the Reagan administration wants to start an army, start training an army among sympathizers of Somoza. So, this takes money. Congress wouldn't give them the money. So, what they did, so what you do is you create the Contras. What the Contras are are a anti-government, anti-Nicaraguan, democratically elected government force that's trying to destroy the force. So, for example, those of you who've been to the Uni University of Oregon and the Ben Linder room, who was Ben Linder? Well, when you go to the EMU, if you go to the EMU, Ben Linder room, the bottom floor of the EMU, who that's named for is a former college student okay, from Portland who not only dressed up as a clown and rode a, a unicycle and all that kind of stuff and juggled, not only did he do that, but he was into sustainable energy. And so here's what he did. He went down, he was interested in basically what he did is essentially go down to 
of this remote village in Nicaragua, and he built a dam. Now the dam was if you could, let's see, visualize the door or visualize, say, this blackboard. And he built a dam on a stream that was really no farther than, say, three or four feet deep. But, and the dam itself was 20 feet high on the stream, which is basically in a, like a narrow canyon. So essentially what he did is he built a hydroelectric dam which could power the water now, it's been harnessed as a dam, uh, the water could power a refrigerator in the clinic. Now why they needed a refrigerator was they had polio vaccines to keep them cool and preserved so that they could basically begin. So under Samosa, the dictator, the US-backed dictator, literacy was less than 10%. Under the Sandinistas, literacy soared because in order to have people be health conscious, they have to be able to read. In order to have people not die, have a high infant mortality rate, you need to vaccinate them. The, vaccinations, the vaccines need to be kept cool. So Ben Linder, uh, as part of uh, his schooling, basically came and built a dam on this stream in a remote area of Nicaragua. And uh, the dam was essentially to keep the vaccines cold. Well, U.S. paid Contras crossed two mountain ranges to kill Ben Linder specifically targeting him. That is, the American government paid foreign mercenaries to kill an American citizen. Yes, illegally. But well, they did it. For building the dam. For building the dam. For vaccines. That's what he was doing. That kind of stuff. Okay, so yes, he did have a gun, but because the reason he had a gun, not because he's a soldier, but because they were regular attacks of the Contras. And the Contras basically crossed two mountain ranges to basically try and blow up the dam and stop him from building more dams. Did they blow up the dam? I don't think they did, but apparently, I don't know, and I don't know whether the expertise, but essentially that's what he was doing. What I don't know Dan if they replicated that expertise what there. What did Daniel Ortega have to say about that? Well, he, Ben Linder became a national hero, and that's why, you know, at the time, that's why he got a, a room named for him at the U of O, even though he wasn't necessarily a U of O student. Okay, but that's who Ben Linder was. So, Ben Linder and the Contras, right? So, Contras are an insurgent army funded by the U.S. to topple the Sandinistas without congressional funding. The Reagan administration seeks other sources of funding. So, without legal sources of funding, they find illegal sources of funding. Huh, where would that be? So there is a book, Dark Alliance, written by Gary Webb, an investigative journalist. Wrote a four-day uh, expose story for the San Jose Mercury News called Dark Alliance. He later authored a book of the same name. In it, he documents how Contra supplied tons of cac cocaine to black street gangs, using the proceeds to fund weapons and also supplying weapons to the gangs. All right, so when Peter Jennings basically talks about why this plague, well, part of this plague was created by your tax dollars. That is, the CIA is your tax dollars. But CIA was essentially breaking the law by allowing drugs to be brought into the country and weapons supplied to the gangs through the CIA. So, for example, Daniel Blandon, a Nicaraguan, youngest son of a wealthy Nicaraguan landowner, married, wife, Chapita, two daughters, Bachelor's of Arts degree, National University of Nicaragua, Master's degree in Marketing. <laughs> right. 
University of Columbia, Bogota, has relatives in Bay in Bay Area of uh, San Francisco and Miami, uh, resident in Managua and San Diego, supporter of the Somoza uh, since college. His in-laws were prominent figures in Somoza's Liberal Party, worked for Somoza's government in the late 70s, raised money for the Contra Army in U.S. during the 1980s. Full-time DEA informant, ran a timber company, uh, pled guilty to conspiracy to distribute cocaine in 1992, shows up in DEA files as a drug trafficker in, in 1981, Admin, admitted to distributing coke for a particular organization and sold it to Rick Ross, not the rapper, but uh, also from LA. So Freeway Ricky Ross sold cocaine in California, Florida, Oklahoma City, and New Orleans. So this is where Danilo Blandin was taped by the DEA bragging about thousands of kilos of cocaine he sold to black gangs in Los, An Los Angeles since 1981. Freeway Rick Ross, now in prison in San Diego, created a mass market for crack in the inner city of Los Angeles and elsewhere thanks to the connection of his cocaine suppliers, which are a group of men connected to the CIA around the guerrilla army. So Ricky Ross was actually uh, stung by DEA, and that's what was used to take him down. Now, the interesting thing with these particular busts and this whole operation, was I was working gangs in uh, the 80s, early 80s, um, and left there in 83. The gangs were previously dealing uh, PCP, a liquid PCP also known as water, and generally didn't have guns, not at least in, not at least in the uh, amount uh, portrayed uh, usually in movies and things like that. The, um, there's a book written by uh, Jeffrey Canada called Fist, Stick, Knife, Gun, talking about the regression of violence where in the days, he and I are roughly the same age, in the days, uh, basically, you settled things with your fists. If you had a beef with somebody. And maybe a stick was the only weapon that you'd have if you felt you were outnumbered. Uh, maybe a knife. But then, because uh, guns were expensive. But when guns became more available, i.e. they were supplied, so for example, um, not that I have the tech to show this, but Nickerson Gardens is a famous housing project in Watts. Someone left during this time that we're talking about, the mid-80s, a semi-trailer truck full of automatic weapons and ammo, unlocked outside of Nickerson Gardens. Like, who has the money to do that? Like the mafia just kind of run out of gas and watts and just leave an unlocked weapons truck? No, don't think so. So who has the money to do that? Hmm, well. So mainstream press, even Webb's own newspaper, attacked him, though his report and the book were well-researched and sourced and true. It seemed that uh, there was an agreement forced in the 80s. The CIA and the Justice Department agreed that the CIA only had to report illegal activity done by sworn CIA officers, not assets. They did not have to drug or report drug trafficking offenses at all by any word, anyone. In other words, the CIA knew that operatives in its employ were importing cocaine and guns into America and supplying drug dealing gangs. And they caught an airplane in Houston, and they, they caught a guy, Richard Secord, that was involved, yeah. and he was convicted. Yeah, well, yeah, that one airplane. There were other airplanes uh, coming in through uh, Panama that Noriega knew about, and so all this was basically going to fund the Contras. The Contras eventually lost. 
Nicaragua is still in the hands of more or less the Sandinistas to this day. But we are stuck with the drug problem. So, how Webb was attacked on the credibility of his claim. So, C Webb never said the CIA started the entire crack epidemic, nor did they supply all the gangs. He stated with certainty, using law enforcement services as well as declassified government uh, documents as well as congressional testimony, basically. So, one of the things that also happened with uh, law enforcement is that People like Blandon kept getting busted by LA County sheriffs and LAPD who weren't on the take. But every time the arresting officers arrested Blandon, they themselves were arrested and charged with basically um, corruption. And so they dropped their investigation, right? So. One can say with certainty, the CIA had full knowledge of drugs entering the country through one or several of their informants. When these informants were arrested by local law enforcement, they were never charged. The arresting officers themselves were charged with corruption and allowed to leave the force. Webb's death in 2004 was ruled a suicide after initial reports said there were two gunshot wounds to his face. Then the report was changed by the coroner to one. And this is a law enforcement source that said the medical report said there were two gunshot wounds, not the one that, the court, that eventually got into the coroner report. He, one of his DEA contacts, thinks he was murdered because he was working on a new story continuing about CIA drug trafficking. Just, so. It was like Air America in Vietnam. Like Air America, right. So part of the piece in terms of looking at this entire episode, in terms of looking at our entire drug epidemic to this day in the early 21st century, is that uh, while it started as an illegal operation by a section of government, whether or not Ronald Reagan is complicit in that doesn't really matter. There are people below him who were. Like the head of the CIA at that time. Like the head of the CIA at the time as well as others. Huh? George Bush Sr. That's my speculation. That shouldn't be there, but All right, so one of the connections that I mentioned that I want to talk about within, um, again, with this problem of um, CIA support or at least non-action and also thwarting the action of other sections of law enforcement with dealing with the drug problem, uh, the connection with Jesse Jackson, for example, and the Nation of Islam. So whenever you have a president or a black person running for president, you deal with the fact that there's going to be death threats. Like, President Obama has had, in his first year in office, the more death threats against him than all other presidents in history combined. When the Secret Service, but once you become a legitimate candidate, you qualify for Secret Service pro protection. So Jesse Jackson qualified for that twice. In his second bid, he, before he qualified for Secret Service protection, he had um, the Nation of Islam do his security. So the Food of Islam, that's who, FOI, Food of Islam defending, who guard Elijah Muhammad. Jesse's security before he qualified for Secret Service protection was the FOI, Food of Islam under the direction of Nation of Islam leader Louis Farrakhan. 
While Farrakhan's views were all often problematic and at odds with Jesse's public stances, he resisted, uh, the, Jesse resisted pressure to criticize Farrakhan for definitely not, not only uh, essentially saving his life because the, se the Secret Service reported 365 legitimate threats to Jackson's life. Now, if they consider it legitimate, it's a real threat, not just somebody phoning in a random prank call. Fruit of Islam doesn't, didn't talk about what the threats that they recognize, but. So, Farrakhan, during the 80s, in response, and I said historically, uh, one of the, with the destruction of uh, the Black Panther Party, uh, one of the or forms of organized resistance to looking at uh, dealing with the problems that arose out of um, the destruction of black power organizations and the response uh, to the rise of drug-related crime, uh, the Nation of Islam was one of those organizations. So pow uh, power, that is the acronym People Organized and Working for Economic Rebirth, the reason that the nation was looking at organ, uh, economic rebirth is the idea that a lot of uh, young people were not, unable to get jobs and basically were working the drug trade be, to be able to get money. Farrakhan, even though he, uh, he broke with Elijah Muhammad's son Wallace, World Community of Al-Islam in the West, Wallace did not denounce his father's teaching that white people were created by an evil black scientist and that the white man was the devil. Farrakhan still kind of uh, quite as adhered to that. He recreated the Nation of Islam in 78 and drew upon many young people affected by drugs, poverty, and powerlessness, many of them former uh, drug dealers, because the Nation of Islam has, uh, as I've said before, is in terms of sheer numbers the most effective program for getting black people off of drugs, has a prison outreach, uh, has um, legal employment for them. So power was created to build a nationwide cooperative of black-owned businesses to give jobless youth and others viable and legal employment. So. Nation of Islam has been also responsible for cleaning housing projects of drug dealers without firing a shot. Prison outreach and drug addiction treatment centers liberate more African Americans from addiction and criminality than all 12 steps combined. But it's really not given, um, well, otherwise, other than hearing it here, basically you don't necessarily hear about those two particular efforts. Though the nation is considered an extremist group, Reagan and the CIA considered them linked to Arab terrorists. It also didn't help them, uh, that image from Libya's Gaddafi extended a $5 million interest-free loan to start power. Libya was con considered a terrorist state then. Uh, so for example, uh, the reason there's a $5 million interest-free loan is that Interest-free loans are actually a feature of uh, Muslim banks because it's considered, um, basically a loan is considered helping your neighbor and it's against uh, Quranic principles to profit from helping your neighbor. The attractiveness of the nation stems from the lack of solutions from the Christian American mainstream in terms of employing people, dealing with uh, racism, for example, as a problem in addiction, and other things. So when we look at, for example, the names of the dead, especially in the 80s, 70s, Leonard Deadweiler, who was killed by the uh, California Highway Patrol, uh, Eula May Love, uh, killed by the LAPD, Stephen Biko, South African Defense Force, Fanny Lee ha Lou Hamer, Arthur McDuffie, uh, the Miami Dade Police Department, and William Stevenson, uh, Portland Public Police Bureau. Um, I guess I could talk about that, but basically the, the names of the dead, these are some of the people, some of the all black people who have been killed by police forces, not only globally, 
but within a phenomenon that we talk about in terms of justifiable homicide and that basically flame uh, certain attitudes uh, where you have distrust of the police. So I'm going to also move into uh, the 90s. So the I Am Public Health model and lessons from the LA Rebellion. So this uh, graphic I got as a, uh, by Googling uh, the phrase, addiction is slavery. So the idea within a particular framework that's African American is that slave, both slavery and addiction are big business. And that there are structures in society that keep them in place. So just like we saw with the CIA and governmental support of addiction, where sections of the government illegally allow the importation of cocaine and the arming of uh, drug dealing gangs, that basically has effects on the community. So, so in the 1990s, we talked about Who is president? First, the first Bush. And in South Africa, there's a connection between South Africa and America. So, President Bush and uh, de Klerk. So, in America and South America. So, what's going on? The uh, song, The World is a Ghetto. There's the first Gulf War. Uh, Nelson Mandela is freed. Uh, the LA Rebellion. The OJ Simpson trial. And I'll have to adjust that mathematical formula. By the band war. By the band war, right. So the connection between America and South America and the difference between a strong man and a dictator. And the difference between a freedom fighter and a terrorist and the difference between a riot and a rebellion. So the connection between South America and South Africa, apartheid and Jim Crow, Soweto and South Central, drug wars and wars against terrorism. So Soweto is an acronym which means Southwest Township. So under apartheid, which is, was inspired by the, uh, the uh, uh, apartheid is uh, Afrikaans for apartness, it basically means racial separation, like Jim Crow, and it was inspired by American Jim Crow. Southwest Township was a uh, township outside of Johannesburg, South Africa, uh, where townships were essentially exclusively black, uh, and they didn't have um, running water, sewer, but they did have plenty of bars, and South Central which while there is an American infrastructure, there's also plenty of bars. So drug wars and wars against terrorism are featured of those places. So the difference between a strong man and a dictator is we like strong men because of money. One likes the US, the other wants to keep their homeland the way it was. So a strong man and a dictator. And so dictator is basically used from the point of view of the government that doesn't like a person because of their pro-homeland stance. The difference between a riot and a rebellion is that a riot is chaotic and unplanned, a rebellion is planned and orchestrated to achieve certain ends. So hence, the 65 Watts riots were a riot, the 92 LA rebellion was a rebellion, it was planned. So in the early 90s, Nelson Mandela was incarcerated for 28 years as a president, as president of the African National Congress. He represented the largest opposition group of black South Africans seeking an end to apartheid in South Africa, i.e. The, the, the imposition or the uh, creation of one person, one vote rule. The ANC waged both a guerrilla war and sought peaceful political change 
So for example, in the 80s under apartheid South Africa, South Africa killed more than 1.6 million Africans in neighboring African culture, in, in neighboring African countries, basically in support of a war to support apartheid. International pressure, including sanctions, led to Mandela's freedom and eventually free elections and Mandela's election in South Africa as first one person, one vote president elect. Because in South Africa, not only did they segregate uh, politics, but they also segregated health care and other things, AIDS prevention, among other things. The official U.S. State, Pol to policy, State Department policy of constructive engagement under Reagan uh, with the apartheid South African government was driven by the fact that the United States in the 80s was South Africa's largest trading partner and its second largest foreign investor, 21 billion uh, in U.S. dollars in the 80s. Companies often argued that their presen presence was beneficial to the black majority even though they had discriminatory hiring practices um, and those discriminatory practices were the norm. So it could be argued truthfully that apartheid was uh, inspired by Jim Crow's laws and Reagan's gov government argued for constructive engagement rather than disinvestment. So meaning that American universities and other corporations take their money out of South Africa and cause the uh, collapse of the regime. Picture of Nelson and his then wife Winnie after he won election. In his tribal gown, tribal um, regalia. One of the things that uh, I like and use about the South Africa in terms of looking at uh, the rule of law, like what happens when you switch from uh, racial segregation to a more democratic form of government, how do you change the laws to do that? Now, what I, in a reading of the South African Constitution, so this is their Bill of Rights. We the people of South Africa recognize the injustices of our past, honor those who suffered for justice and freedom in our land, respect those who have worked to build and develop our country, and believe that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, united in our diversity. We therefore through our freely elected representatives adopt this constitution as the supreme law of the republic so as to heal the divisions of the past and establish a society based on democratic values, social justice, and fundamental human rights. Lay the foundations for a democratic and open society in which the government is based on the will of the people and every citizen is equally protected by law. Improve the quality of life of all citizens and free the potential of each person. Build a united and democratic South Africa able to take its rightful place as a sovereign state in the family of nations. May God protect our people in three different languages. Founding provisions. So what I, uh, the reason I'm highlighting this is because when we you switch from one system of government to another, so for example, part of these uh, was, there was some technical assistance offered by uh, black lawyers, no, notably um, Charles Ogletree from Harvard, who uh, helped write uh, some of the provisions of this particular uh, document. So what, one of the things when you compare the South African Constitution with the American Constitution, which actually in, the American Constitution enshrines some aspects of racism, the South African Constitution actually attempts to undo uh, the past uh, effects of racism. So Republic of South Africa is one sovereign democratic state founded on the following values. Human dignity, the achievement of equality and advancement of human rights and freedoms non-racialism and non-sexism, 
supremacy of the Constitution and the rule of law, universal adult suffrage, a national common voters' role, regular elections, and a multi-party system of democratic and government to ensure accountability, responsiveness, and openness. So universal adult suffrage means that every adult human being can vote without restriction. The Bill of Rights. South African Constitution provides for 11 official languages, promotes respect for 11 or more on cultural or religious grounds, as well as sign language. In his Bill of Rights, it declares, the state may not unfairly discriminate directly or indirectly against anyone on one or more grounds, including race, gender, sex, pregnancy, marital status, ethnic or social origin, color, sexual orientation, age, disability, religion, conscience, belief, culture, language, and birth. I compare that to the American Constitution and the American Bill of Rights. The official languages of the Republic are Sepedi, Sesotho, Setswana, Siswati, Sishivinda, Sikzonga, Afrikaans, English, Indibele, Kosa, and Zulu. Recognizing the historically diminished use and status of the indigenous languages of our people, the state must take practical and positive measures to elevate the status and advance the use of these languages. Promote and create conditions for the development and use of all official languages, the Khoi, Nama, and San languages, and sign language. So indigenous people and also those for, uh, who are deaf. In promote and ensure respect for languages including German, Greek, Gujarati, Hindi, Portuguese, Tamil, Telugu, Urdu, and other commonly used by communities in South Africa, and Arabic, Hebrew, Sanskrit, and others used for religious purposes. So remember, this is Africa, which is a continent, not a country. One country, so the, the rule, is multilingualism. So here is a country that has enshrined that within its constitution. That was actually the rule of Turtle Island before 1492, multilingualism. So here's a place where this has been enshrined by law. So South African conditions. So it's rich in strategic minerals as well as gold and diamonds, but all that wealth is in private, multinational hands, so great Constitution and Bill of Rights, but no money to pull it off. I was saying the, the power of the money is still in the hands of the, of the former people that had the money. Yeah. They haven't been able to do that job yet. And it might be dangerous for them to nationalize it, too. But the apartheid government developed nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons to use against the black majority while they were in power and receiving technical, technical assistance in that effort. So last week when I was talking about ethnic-specific bioweapons, uh, the South African government before apartheid, or rather during apartheid, was part of uh, one of the recipients of that. So re receiving technical assistance for that from the United States, Israel, Soviet Union, and 11 other countries. Government uh, under apartheid allowed AIDS prevention and treatment to whites only. So again, wonderful constitution, no money to pull it off or con con uh, correct the current conditions. So part of the parallels that I'd like to draw between America and South Africa is that South Africa and America are linked in terms of their race relations and their policies around race relations. United States researched ethnic-specific biological weapons and gave technical assistance to South Africa. Gave years of state-sponsored torture and terrorism, an internal pass system for blacks only, homelands, forced relocation, reservation, shanty towns with no water, sewer, basic services, but plenty of bars. So even though in the United States you have sort of, uh, you, well, we don't have the internal pass system, anymore, though we did have, in effect, sundown laws in the South and also in Oregon until the 50s and 60s. 
So we had a lot of similar situations within of how you would impose uh, non segregation based on particular characteristics. So given the history of South Africa, you might think millions of black Africans who might be justified in slaughtering a few hundred thousand whites, but they didn't. When blacks came to power, they established the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Basically, you get immunity from prosecution if you say what you did. And with certain exceptions, like doc, the so-called Dr. Death, who oversaw Project Coast, which was a germ warfare program, uh, a white apartheid-era South African judge ruled him innocent despite the evidence of his crimes. That is, he directed the ethnic-specific bioweapon program in South Africa. There is a um, song by... Uh, George Clinton, uh, called Martial Law, and this is a lyric from it. Uh, Dr. Dre sings, before I shrivel up and die, let me tell you about this, tell you a story about the FBI, CIA, LAPD of the USA. Ask me why I list them, talk about that system. Let us take a look and see what's up today. Taking away whites from the people, that's wrong. Rodney Cake says, can we get along? Beat down by the man whose check he paid. Stacy Coons was just a drop in a bucket full of wicked cops. No fire hose can wash that blood away. There is Mr. King. Rest in peace, Rodney. This is a still from the video of him being beaten, stomped. The Los Angeles Rebellion. So previous shots were Rodney King being beaten by four LAPD officers surrounded by LAPD, Highway Patrol, and other officers after a routine traffic stop. Uh, this incident differed from thousands like it only in that it was videotaped and witnessed. Now that had, stuff like that had been going on. That's why I had that list of the deads. All those, all, all those folks had been killed by police forces. Uh, the last one that I mentioned, William Stevenson. Uh, he was killed in Portland in, let's see, when was that? I believe the 80s. Um, he was an off-duty security guard, worked for Fred Myers witnessed a fight between two white men at a 7-Eleven, uh, tried to break it up, somebody had called the cops, meanwhile the cops showed up, tried to arrest him, even though he protested and said, you know, it wasn't me, it wasn't me, and witnesses around them said, it wasn't him, it was two white guys. The Portland police officers responding uh, applied a carotid hold and killed him and refused to call 911 and the ambulance when he was non-responsive. They, um, then, you know, there was a community outcry and they, the community, so these two officers, uh, or officers sympathetic to them, printed up t-shirts that said, don't choke them, smoke them. What was the gentleman's name again? William Stevenson. So, public outcry called for the cops' arrest in Los Angeles. Oh, also Portland, too. So, South Central LA. Have I talked about this before? The underlying causes of the rebellion? I don't think you, I don't think you did. Okay. Let's talk about how you do prevention and the infrastructure around how is addiction supported economically? The connection between addiction and slavery is that they're both supported by social structures. So there is alcohol outlet density. That is, if you have a liquor store, and California differs in uh, from Oregon in that pretty much any place that sells groceries can sell hard liquor. 
In Oregon, only liquor stores can sell hard liquor. But in California, gas stations can sell hard liquor. And do. All right? Now, some people think this is not such a great idea and that these should be limited. And, and its policy is called alcohol outlet density. That is, within a certain geographic area, X amount of liquor stores. All right, go back to slide. Thank you. All right, so South Central Los Angeles, depending on how you define that, was zoned for 250 liquor stores. That's the legal limit, the alcohol outlet density. It possessed 750 plus. Now, since it's city government that decides how many, both the alcohol outlet density and how many liquor stores get permitted in, they're breaking their own law by allowing 750 plus. Now, here's part of the problem. We're talking about the early 90s. So Bush gives way to Clinton. The FBI under Clinton made a correlation between the number of liquor stores. And the reason that alcohol outlet density is important is the more alcohol outlets you have, here's what the FBI said, 50% of all crime was alcohol related. Therefore, if you reduce the number of liquor outlets, you reduce the crime. See, not all crimes are being done by alcoholics, but, you know, alcohol does make you stupider. Therefore, committing more crimes. So, 50%, 40 to 50% of all crime is alcohol-related. So, if you reduce the liquor stores, you reduce the crime. Now, one of the things that, if you did, did the analysis, that the lower the per capita income, that is, the poorer the neighborhood, the more liquor stores went up. Therefore, there was more crime in poor neighborhoods. And it's not just that in Beverly Hills, there's less liquor stores because people have wine cellars and they can have their own bars in their house. It's also there's less crime, at least in that, that particular sense. So South Central was zoned for 250 liquor stores. It possessed 750 plus. Okay? Breaking their own law. Okay. Now, the federal government, in my consultant practice, one of the, the agencies that I consulted with was the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention. And CSAP basically funded 250 partnerships across the country to look at community-wide solutions to dealing with substance abuse problems. And one of the things that they dealt with, especially in minority communities, was alcohol outlet density. All right? So the South Central Partnership, which was one of seven federally funded CSAP community coalitions in LA, did a community survey and found that the community felt that the number one problem was too many liquor stores. That was the perception. And then the partnership then went and did the um, footwork and then found, yes, you're right. Not only are there too many liquor stores, a lot of these are illegal. You have three times the alcohol, the legal alcohol outlet density. What do we do about it? So this is an example, for example, of type, of type six sociostructural violence. Alcohol outlet density. And how you basically look, detect it is in, through uh, using disproportionality. Well, if the legal limit is, basically disproportionality starts at twice a, a phenomenon, twice the rate, the normal rate of a phenomenon, this is three times. So, for example, the poorer the neighborhood, the more alcohol outlets in it. 
40% of all crime is alcohol related, 40 to 50%. The more alcohol outlets, the greater the crime in the area. After Vietnam, so socio-structural violence is basically caused by normal structures in society producing a discriminatory effect. So after Vietnam, the government encouraged business in the hood, that is black communities, but mostly favored liquor stores other, other types, over other types of businesses. So they pushed vets, black vets in particular, to open liquor stores rather than grocery stores, hardware stores, etc. From the community's point of view, alcohol wasn't the only problem. Liquor stores were also magnets for sex industry and drug paraphernalia, paraphernalia for example, crack pipes, single Brillo pads, so if you don't know about the single Brillo pad thing, um, one of my clients, basically, who, uh, whose parents were crack addicts, basically was sent to the um, store as a little kid to buy baby food, straws, and single Brillo pads. Now, you go into a store today, you can't buy a single Brillo pad. So, being able to be sold a single Brillo pad is an indication of drug activity. Because here's what happens. You buy baby food, you take, clean out the baby food jar, you stick in a Brillo pad, and punch a hole in the top, and you have an instant crack pipe. Okay? So single Brillo pads are not, no, oh, I just have a single skillet to clean, and I can't afford a package of Brillo. Come on, no. It's always evidence of you know, there's a crack addict somewhere, right? So, liquor stores were basically magnets for prostitution, sell, actually selling crack pipes and selling things like single brillo pads, right? So, how do you reduce liquor stores to the legal limit when there are three times too many? How do you do that? A lot of money lost too from taxes. Mm, yeah. How do you do that? Burn, baby, burn. That's how you do it. So the predictable Rodney King verdict provided the match. Good. So since I have one minute. We'll just leave it here. Sociostructural violence. How do you get a cop off? So we'll talk about this. Right? Because it's a great case study for what happens in communities. All right? So roll music. We'll be back on Wednesday. Your midterms are due then, too. Don't forget. online.